a, a group of real American warriors and heroes, so I, I'm honored. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about my background and where I got to where I am in my life, and I want to talk a little bit about an issue that's uh, dear to me, which I see as a threat to the country, which I'll go into, but then I'll get into the story, which is why I'm here, which is a, a story that's never been told about the Korean War. So um, but before I get started, let me say I'm, I got some good news and bad news. The good news is I made it here from LA. I'm here. That's, I got here. Uh, it was a rough trip, but a few missed planes. And, but the bad news is the books are right behind me. So they're going to get here I got to take, Lynn's going to take exactly what you want, how you want them signed, and I'll have them shipped to you and you'll get them in a few days. So I apologize, but my printer sent them to the wrong address, and that was a nightmare. I tried to get them overnighted, but they couldn't do it. So anyway, the books will get to you uh, shortly. Um, let me take a step back. I, I was a, I, after I left the military, I was a bond trader, and I spent about uh, 20 years on Wall Street trading emerging market debt. And I'll just tell a quick story. I was in Nevis, which is a, a mount, a, a, an island down the Caribbean chain, almost to Venezuela. And I was there to help the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank manage their bond portfolio, which uh, they, they have a common currency like the euro down the Caribbean chain. And so they all use the same currency among the, all the islands. And while I was there, I got invited over to speak to the Bank of Nevis and see if they, uh, they, they wanted to hear the capabilities we had at the firm I was with. And I walked into this room and I'm not kidding you, to the board of this bank, it's a little shack on the beach, basically. And it was just a bunch of old crotchety old looking men. One actually had a patch on his eye. And so I walked in there and I sat down and he said, uh, they introduced me and I stood up and said, thank you for uh, letting me come speak to you. And he said, well, son, you're here to listen, not to talk. And the, the reason I say that is I don't want this to be that way. If you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, please feel free to interrupt me. I just want to make this interactive, if you will. But I was going to be an architect. I, I was, had my room at Georgia Tech. I was all excited. I was accepted to the college my senior year in high school. But this guy kept coming around um, my house, a friend of my father's, and he said, have you ever thought about the Air Force Academy? And I, I had absolutely no desire to do that whatsoever. But he kept pushing me. And so I, I, I did the medicals. I, I filled out all the forms. I did the, the um, you know, interviews with the congressman senators, et cetera, and I had kind of forgotten about it. And it was April of my senior year in college, and this, there was a knock on the door. I was in class, and the guy said, there's a call for Todd Wood in the principal's office. And the teacher said, well, take a message. He's in class. And they said, well, it's Senator Sam Nunn from Washington. So I went and talked to the senator. He said, do you want to go to the Air Force Academy? And I said, sure. And uh, I, I can remember being so naive. I thought I was going to have the best time of my life. This is going to be great. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Little did I know, it's, it's a great place to visit, let me put it that way. Um, but four years later, I left with a, an aeronautical engineering degree, and I, uh, I, I, got a, I didn't know really what I wanted to do in the Air Force, and I, I, I knew I wanted to fly. And I got a ride in a Blackhawk, uh, which was there giving rise to some of the cadets toward the end of my senior year. And the experience of just flying over the trees at 150 knots, you know, 10 feet over the trees was just fantastic. So I fell in love with helicopters. And I actually had a general at the academy tell me I didn't spend a quarter million dollars at the time, this was 1986, for you to go fly a helicopter. Because in the Air Force, it's all about fighter jets and F-15s and F-22s and all that. But um, I did it anyway. And, that, that, and uh, funny enough that after 9-11, the terrorist attacks, uh, special ops, which I ended, ended up going into, kind of became the whole Air Force. And my old commander retired as, as chief of staff of the Air Force. So it's... Strange how things go in circles sometimes, but I, I went to flight school uh, with the Army um, in L.A., uh, not Los Angeles, but Lower Alabama. I don't know if you've ever been there to Enterprise, Alabama. It's the only place I know that in the city, in the center of the town, they have a huge statue of a bug. And the, the reason is that they, about 100 years ago, they were all planting cotton, and the boll weevil came and ate all their cotton and forced them to plant peanuts, and they all got rich. So they, they're very fond of the boll weevil down there. Um, so I, I left uh, flight school and I went to uh, Kirkland Air Force Base in New Mexico and trained in combat rescue helicopters. At the time we were flying H-3s, the Jolly Green Giants from Vietnam era. Uh, and I got sent to Alaska and I, I did um, search and rescue up there for about three years. And we were deployed all over Asia. We would go to, um, you know, th uh, Philippines, Thailand, South Korea at the time, Japan and basically support the Asian units there if there was any exercises or whatever. But when we were back in Alaska, we would sit alert 
uh, in case there was something, you know, Alaska is a huge state. If you, if you look on a map from like the Aleutian chain to the North Slope, it stretches from New York to California. It's that big. Uh, if you basically look at the distance. So it's, it's a huge area and then the civilian rescue really didn't have a, a big capability. So if there was any, we sat alert, so if there's any problems that they couldn't handle, uh, they would uh, call us. So I'll give you one quick story about that. In 1988, there was um, a really low pressure system in Alaska and the pressure got so low in the, uh, that you couldn't dial the altimeter down in the cockpit to get the right altitude reading and it got very cold. It was about 60 below ambient temperatures, uh, probably not as cold as the frozen chosen in Korea, but it was, it was cold. And it was about one, minus 120 wind chill. And there was a guy who was um, about six hours flight outside of Anchorage where we were based who was chopping wood. He was a caretaker at a mine and he uh, threw his back out cutting wood and he was going to freeze to death. He couldn't, he didn't have any heat source. So they launched us and everything, all the aircraft, the FAA grounded all the aircraft in theater except for us. And so we took off with two tankers, uh, excuse me, two H3 Jolly Green Giants and one uh, air refueling tanker, C-130. And we got about two hours outside of Anchorage and tried to, we, we would air refuel off of them. There's a hose that comes down and we, there's a probe that extends from the H3 and you, you get gas and you go on. And the, uh, one of the aircraft's probes wouldn't come out, so he had to turn back, so it was just me and the tanker, and then we got above a 12,000 mount, foot mountain range because the passes were obscured with weather, and he lost an engine, so he's down to three engines. Um, we get to the place where the guy was, about a six hour flight across the Chugach Mountains, and we land, and my pararescue para guys, and by the way, we had the full Arctic gear with the parkas and the bunny boots and the fat boy pants and everything to keep you really warm inside the helicopter, and we. They brought the patient on board to PJs and they put an IV in his arm and it froze before it got in his arm. And then we were, uh, I don't know if you know much about a helicopter, but you know, in a fixed wing aircraft, when you go down the runway, you get enough airspeed over the wing, you get going fast enough, it, get, it creates enough lift and the pilot can rotate and take off. Well, in a helicopter, it's just a spinning wing. So you always have that airspeed, but you have to change the angle of attack on the blades to get lift. And so we tried to take off and apply power to the rotor system, we started spinning. And if you know anything about physics, you know, if you remember high school, Newton's law, with one reaction, there's a, always an equal and opposite reaction. So if you got one thing spinning on top of the helicopter, the, the fuselage is gonna wanna spin the other way. So that's why you have that little tail rotor on the back to stop the fuselage from spinning on a helicopter. So when we pull power to try to take off, we started spinning and we realized the uh, oil in the tail rotor gearbox was frozen. So we couldn't change pitch on the tail rotors anyway. We got to some, we took off kind of sideways and landed at a little Alaskan Bush airport and the C-130 landed and took the patient back to Anchorage and so he was fine, but we ended up, we had to stay there four days to repair the helicopter. We could fly, fly it back to Anchorage, but that's one Alaska. Don't go there during the winter. It's, it's really, it can get really cold. Um, so I, 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 volu I, I wanted to fly special operations. So I went back to flight school for about a year and a half uh, at Kirkland Air Force Base in New Mexico to train in the MH-53 Pavlo uh, program and if, if you remember the Iranian hostage rescue that was such a disaster in 1980 well th those guys were fantastic pilots but they just really didn't have the training or the skills uh, for that type of mission or the equipment so they were flying just you know slick uh, H-53s for the Marine Corps um, and so it ended in disaster basically they just didn't have it wasn't their fault they just didn't have the training to do that and so the Air Force after that took the 45 or so uh, super Jolly Green Giants that they had in Vietnam, which were longer range helicopters, air refuelable, and they spent about $40 million a piece on them and turned them into kind of a Battlestar Galactica of helicopters. It had to do that exact mission, which was long range, bad weather, threats, uh, dust storms, whatever, to be able to get in and out of somewhere to get a team in and out, no matter what. And so they put satellite communications on them, a GPS, which was classified at the time, a dual INS, a forward-looking infrared, uh, terrain-following radar, electronic countermeasures, all kind of stuff. So it was really just a, I mean, that's it, um, called the MH-53J Pavlo. So I, I trained for a year and a half to fly that. And our mission was to get uh, the Tier 1 counterterrorism units uh, anywhere in the world, plus or minus five seconds, no matter what the threat was, what the weather was, whatever. So I worked with uh, SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force for three years, flying them around uh, whenever there was a problem. And when I got to, 
well, I, I graduated from my retraining and went to Herbert Field, Florida, uh, which where the uh, first special operations wing was. And they gave us a beeper and two bags, a hot gear and cold weather gear bag. And they said, put these in your garage and you'd get a beep and it'd say, show up at the airfield with your hot weather bag. And you'd get on the C-5s and the helicopters would be folded up and back and uh, you'd take off, you didn't know where you're going, uh, where, you know, how long you'd be gone. And you'd go up to the little um, cabin above the cockpit where the little briefing room was on the C-5 and there would be the ground commander, whether it be a SEAL or, or a Green Beret type. And you would download satellite photos and you'd plan the mission. If it was real time, you'd go right there and deploy and do it. Or otherwise, if you had some time, you would go back and uh, you know, build a mock-up of a, an area or a target and practice. Sometimes two or three months, you know, every night, going practicing, assaulting. And that's what they did for the Bin Laden raid. They had a mock-up of that and they just worked it night after night to get to know where every little nook and cranny was on the site. So I, I got there and I immediately got deployed to Kuwait. And this was in the first time around in the Gulf. And at the time, I wasn't on the mission, but um, the General Schwarzkopf, the, 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 the Iraqis had a really good uh, Soviet, basically, air defense net around a lot of Soviet equipment and, and surface air missiles and radar systems. And General Schwarzkopf at the time wanted a way to basically blow a hole in that net to get to allow the fixed wing aircraft to go through and attack targets inside of Iraq. So he came to my commander and said, you know, Colonel, with your super secret payblows, do you think you can uh, basically lead a flight of an army Apache gunships over the desert where there's nothing that's really hard to navigate onto, so to get them at the right spot. So can you lead them in with all your GPS and everything and, and then let them destroy a put a hole in the radar net so the fixed wing guys can get through. And uh, my Colonel Comer said, uh, yes, sir, General, I think we can. And General Schwarzkopf said, well, Colonel, you get to start the war. So that's what happened that night. They uh, flew, um, they led, two Pueblos led four Army Apaches uh, about a half mile from a radar site. The Iraqis didn't know they were coming. And the Pueblos actually broke chem lights and threw them on the desert floor so the Apaches could come up and update their navigation systems and know exactly where they were so that they could take out the target. And they said once they hit the radar site, it was like being on the 50 yard line of a football game because 30 seconds later you had hundreds of fighter jets coming over, you know, 500 miles an hour, 100 feet over the desert, heading downtown to Baghdad. So that was a real interesting part of my life. I was gone 300 days a year, uh, just a great experience working with some really uh, incredible people. And that, I said, was kind of in the beginning of special operations aviation before, well, not the beginning, Vietnam and was really the beginning, but when we started getting a lot of these very sophisticated aircraft. And today, after 9-11, it became, like I said, my commander became the chief of staff of the Air Force, and all the guys that I flew with are now two, three, four, st four stars in the Air Force, uh, in the Army. And uh, so just a great time in my life. But I, it's a, I have to say it's a young man's game. I don't know if you can relate to that, but uh, it is, I was 29, and I remember this very clearly, I was leading a 10 ship of uh, helicopters over the horizon at night to put in a SEAL team. And, you know, we, we would come in, you, first of all, you got nine helicopters flying off you at night, on goggles, really bad weather, uh, dark, and we, you get close to the water, and in a helicopter, you lose all depth perception once you get close to the water because you got to realize it's moving, right? So you can't like fly level. You got to go on the instruments and your crew member actually talks you down. So you kind of turn control of the aircraft over him, over to him and the gunner or the uh, flight engineer in one of the windows or on the tail will say down, sir, left one, right two, and he'll get you right where he wants you. And then he'll kick the boats out and, th and then you take off and go. Um, but I was on this mission at night and um, came in over the water and I, I was in a hover and I can remember just, I didn't know what it was and it was kind of these black shapes moving around and it was pitch black on goggles, the goggles that weren't even helping. And so I realized it was the waves coming up over the top of the rotor system and I said, oh, this is enough. I've, this, I'm turning 30, this is enough. <laughs> so I, uh, I put my papers in and, and three months later I left the Air Force and they actually shut down the uh, exit door after I left because they spent a lot of money training me but um, uh, anyway, I, I won't forget those days. It was a fantastic experience. So that's me on some blown up airfield in Kuwait. I don't even remember where it was. Uh, 
That's flying on a very bright night on goggles. I, I relate it to like, uh, and I know these war stories aren't anything to what some of you guys experience, but uh, I'll just tell them anyway. But a, uh, if you're flying on goggles at night, I relate it to driving a Greyhound bus at 100 miles an hour, looking through two little green toilet paper tubes that you can barely see out of. So it's kind of like that. Uh, that's putting in seal boats. So I left the Air Force and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I had an uncle who was fairly connected in business in Atlanta, Georgia. So I went down there and he set up a bunch of meetings for me uh, with attorneys, consulting firms, law or, uh, uh, investment banks, hospitals, you know, medical firms, that kind of thing. And I was sitting in the office of a man who ran a company called Robinson Humphrey in Atlanta, which was an old investment bank that actually brought Home Depot public years ago. And I'm sitting there and he's reading my resume and he said, oh, you flew? And I said, yeah. And he said, what'd you fly? And I told him, he said, oh, really? And he said, look at the wall. And there was a picture of an H-53 that he'd flown in Vietnam, same aircraft. And so uh, he said, you're hired. So that's how I got in the investment banking business. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I got really interested in an offshore fixed income and so I, I've specialized in areas like Cayman, the Channel Islands, uh, Hong Kong, um, Bermuda. I, I thought an island where there's a lot of banks and a beach sounds like a great place to, to work. So I traveled around for about almost 20 years to places like that and really worked with hedge funds and central banks and uh, asset managers and corporations and insurance companies and all that and just worked with them on their bond portfolios. But um, as I became more knowledgeable in that area, I started to realize that I'd seen a lot of military threats to the country. You know, I had a top secret at special compartmental intelligence clearance. And so I saw a lot of stuff, but I started to realize that there are other threats to the country as well, and not just military. And as a bond trader, we would have countries or corporations come to us on the desk and say, look, we want to raise a few hundred million dollars in the bond market. Can you, do, can you sell these bonds for us? And we go to the market. And there'd be no buyers, there are only buyers at a certain interest rate that they couldn't afford. So they're basically shut out of the capital market. So I started to realize that at some point, um, a country can really just lose its way financially. And I'm really worried about that. And I'll talk about this real briefly as for us in the United States, because it's not just military threat, it's that, which is our national debt. So we're over $20 trillion now. And I don't know if you know much about the bond market, but it really is very powerful because it sets the interest rates on money that you borrow and what businesses, where business, businesses can get money and how expensive that money is. And right now we're paying basically nothing uh, because the Federal Reserve has acted like a buyer in the markets. They come in and artificially lowered, artificially created more demand for our debt so that the prices are uh, higher, so that the interest rates are very low. So basically we're paying nothing on this $20 trillion in debt. So even if we get a 1% interest rise in rate rise, that could be $300 billion in interest rate service cost. And think about where interest rates were back in the 70s. If you remember a mortgage was 10%, 7, 8, 10%. At one point, you know, 20%. We, if, we, if, if the market takes back control of the debt markets, and, and our interest rate as we pay as a nation, we're not going, we can't afford it because our whole federal budget will go to just paying the debt on our interest. So this is something I like to highlight with people and it's just an issue for me because I saw what it can do. Think about it, if you're a, let's say you're a family, makes $100,000 a year for your family and you have $100,000 in credit card debt, short-term debt. Because our, our debt is very short term. We're, all, we're not even locked in at these zero rates for 30 years. If they go up, we have to go up with them because we haven't extended the maturities of our debt portfolio. So, in, in, so you make 100 grand a year, you got 100 grand in credit card debt and you're borrowing 40 grand a year. Think about how long before the bank cuts you off. So we're giving that power to our enemies as an economic weapon as a country um, because if they decide to not buy our debt or if they decide to, um, there's a flip side to that because it's not just the debt, it's also our currency. Because since World War II, our currency has been a reserve currency where countries and people around the world, if they want to hold something and make it keep its value, they bought dollars because they knew it was safe. Well, that's called a reserve currency status. As, as this problem gets worse and worse, that is going to start to decline and Russia and China and other places are actively pushing us 
pushing world trade out of the dollar into other currencies, so there's not going to be as much demand for our currency. So with the high debt, and if our, the bottom falls out of our currency, it can, it can really lead to a devastating economic situation. Think if you've got a variable loan in your house, your car, your business, and it's you know at 3%, it goes to 15 in a, in a few months. Uh, that is an interest rate shock, and it could happen, and it could really devastate our economy. So I like to just bring this up. This is a... Um, an article not too long ago, a year or so ago, where our debt to our GDP ratio, or the debt we have to our annual income as a country is about 100%. Japan is at 300%. So they owe three times what they make in a year. So they're even worse than we are. And this is an article about China telling Japan, if you don't do what we want, we're going to destroy your economy through the bond market. So this is already happening. It's just not quite to us yet. This is the value of the dollar since 1913. This is a slide that shows the reserve currencies has not always been the dollar. Before it was the British pound or the, the French franc or you know, the Spanish currency or whatever. It only lasts for a period of time. And we have already been about that period of time as a country. So any questions about that before I want to get into the book? I was contacted about a year ago uh, by a man who, uh, I get a lot of people coming into me on Twitter and Facebook and everything because I've written a few novels and I, I write for the Washington Times on national security issues and I had a gentleman come to me and say, I've got a story about my father, would, would you like to hear it? And because I'm trying to get it out there and people need to know about it and I said, sure. And so he sent it to me and the more I read it, the more fascinated I was. And it's a story that has never been told uh, because at the end of the Korean War, the, in, or the forerunner to the NSA, which was called at the time the Army Security Agency, had a technology that they wanted to test in battlefield conditions. So they picked 28 GIs uh, in Germany at the time who were weapons specialists, and they trained them up. It was called battlefield radar. Some of you may have used it, where you can map out the battlefield and see troops coming and armor coming and actual people on the field coming your way. And so you can, in the middle of the night, or whatever, you can pick this out and direct fire on them and, and destroy the target before it gets close enough to you. Um, this was revolutionary at the time. And, and the technology that we had it actually didn't come out for another 10 years uh, until the Vietnam days. So these 28 Americans trained on this radar and they were already, already weapons specialists, primarily anti-aircraft weapons. And so they embedded these guys. Uh, they flew them to Seoul after three months of training. They made them sign all these papers that said you can't talk about what you're going to do. And they inserted them on a hill near the front lines of the Korean War with a company of Republic of Korea, South Korean anti-aircraft artillery troops. So there was about 100 Koreans and about 28 Americans. And uh, there's one story that this man's father who contacted me was married to a German wife at, in 1952 at the time in Germany, right after World War II. So the US, they had children. And the U.S. Army wouldn't treat the family because they didn't recognize the marriage because at that time you couldn't marry a, a Nazi, if you will. So he had a very sick daughter. So he had to find a way to make money for his daughter. So one way he would do it is he would box. And so he would go around to all the uh, military bases on the boxing team and, people, and he would have his buddies bet on him and he'd make money in the betting markets or whatever to, to make money to buy medicine, antibiotics for his two-year-old daughter who was very sick. So he was one of the ones who got volunteered. These guys who didn't volunteer, they got volunteered for this mission, and they sent him to Korea. Um, he literally didn't know that this was going to go down, and once they had volunteer, volunteered him, he couldn't have any contact with his family, so he just disappeared from his wife and kids for three months. And on the way to the airport to, to Korea, his buddies knew what was going on, and they somehow arranged through all the secrecy for his wife to meet him on the side of the road. Uh, the highway on the way to the airport in Germany and they all collected money and gave it to the wife so that the baby could survive. So it's a great story but once they got to Korea they embedded him on this hill, um, Hill 433 which is now in the DMZ and uh, they were testing out the radar and it was working great. Well this was right before the end of the war. Both sides were trying to sign an armistice and get their position in the war better for their side, so push the other side up or back. 
And so right, a few days after they got there and tested all the equipment, they got overrun by thousands of Chinese troops. So here's 28 Americans with 100 Koreans on top of this hill. And the Chinese really wanted this hill. They'd taken out like 14 hills, and this was the last one. And so uh, they basically survived for two weeks um, using this battlefield radar technology. So when they saw the Chinese massing in one corner of the valley heading their way, they could direct Air Force fire or artillery fire on them and break up the assault. And they did this over and over and over and over. Um, but the problem was, since they were so secret and that they were working for basically the NSA, the, uh, the regular army didn't know they were there. So here, that's why they call themselves the Lost Bastards, because they were cut off from Uncle Sam or whatever, you know the saying. So um, anyway, so the colonel or the corporal, Corporal Carpenter, Dick Carpenter, who the guy who I mentioned his father or his son contacted me, was a 21-year-old corporal, and he is uh, a, a very, uh, an expert with weapons. And there's an artillery strike on their compound on top of this hill. And the whole American command staff dies. So the, the lieutenant and the, uh, the other uh, sergeants who are running the whole group. And so he gets a call from the general commanding the whole Korean theater, who found out, by the way, that these guys were there. And he started to send a rescue mission. Um, he said, he gave him a battlefield commission right on the spot. He said, son, you're, a, you know, you're now a second lieutenant. You can't surrender. You can't let the army get the, or the enemy get this technology. So you, you can't surrender and you can't move. You have to stay on top of the hill until we get to you. So 14 of the 28 Americans died um, in horrific ways, I actually have to say. It's all in the book. This is Colonel Dick Carpenter. And so he was given a battlefield commission. And after the battle was over, the army basically said, look, you don't have a college degree. You're not going to get promoted. You need to resign your commission. If you want to go to OCS, you need to go to college go to OCS and come back as an officer. So he did, he resigned his commission. So he's one of the few people who, you know, if you, get a ba if, you're, if you come from the enlisted ranks and become an officer, you're called a Mustang. So he was a rare double Mustang, if you will. So anyway, they, they fought for 14 days. Uh, they eventually were rescued. There's one story that they were seeing, you know, they got very good on this radar and, and they merged with the Korean troops and became very good friends. And there's, there's a lot of good stories about them you know, learning martial arts together and everything because the Chinese eventually overran the hill and they barely made it out alive because they had to, they brought in some Air Force units that were nearby who were able to basically napalm the whole side of the hill. And, and so they were able to evacuate what was left of them. But the, uh, the, there's one scene where they're looking at this radar signal and they're used to people walking and seeing tanks and everything move or artillery. And they, they see this scene or signal on the radar or a screen and, and they didn't know what it was because it kind of looked like water. It was kind of moving around kind of wiggly and they said that's not normal. It was at night so they shot up an artillery flare to illuminate the whole valley and see what was coming their way. And once the flare started coming down they saw 2,000 Chinese climbing up the hill on their bellies, you know, coming to get them. So uh, fascinating story. But uh, so he retired, oh, he didn't retire, he, he survived came back to the United States and, into, and he got a call from uh, the agency when they found out what he did, uh, the CIA, and he ended up working with the CIA in Laos and Vietnam and Nicaragua and was working with Ali North in, Viet in Vietnam or Nicaragua. So just a fascinating individual. And the whole time he was doing this, he was uh, in the probation department, the San Diego probation unit. And then nobody knew what he, he was working for, you know, the spooks. And he would get a call, I, I got to go on vacation for six months and he'd disappear and then he'd come back and so fascinating story but anyway I just want I, I really fell in love with this story I wanted to honor these guys just like uh, Richard Carpenter Dick Carpenter's son did and um, that's why I wrote it that's not very clear I don't know why but that's a picture of Hill 433 in 433 in the DMZ in 1953 you can't make out all the fortifications and everything, but it's there. This is on Google Earth. You can still see the, uh, you know, where they had the gun emplacements and everything. It's, it's all still there. Anyway, with that, uh, oh, one more thing. Um, we're making this into a movie. We have a production company already started. I was just in L.A. for two weeks, and we're trying to get Clint Eastwood to direct it. Uh, his son's going to be in the movie. 
So it's going to be fantastic. I don't know what the title is going to be. It may be Hill 433. It may be Lost Bastards. I'm not sure. But uh, it's really exciting. And it's just funny how it's all falling into place just because we want to really just tell these guys' story. This has never been told before. The Army never told anybody. There was no awards given for this battle. And the families of the men who died on that hill thought they died in Germany. They never knew the truth. It's because the Army just kept it completely classified. So it's just now coming out. But anyway, I'll open it up to questions that you have. Uh, one more thing, I spent a lot of time in Russia. If anybody has a, any questions on Russia and what they're doing. Uh, I spend two or three months a year in Moscow because I, I write for the Washington Times for national security so I can answer any questions there as well.